Guys, give me an audio check. Let me know on Twitter if you can hear me. Awesome. Thank you so much. We'll start in about a minute or so. Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It is a good morning. It's Saturday. I know I told you in the live stream yesterday, in the last hour of treating that uh, I didn't feel I was going to be able to do one today. But my youngest son spent most of last night streaming and playing online gaming with his friends. So he'll be sleeping in today. <laughs> so that gives me the opportunity to do what you all love me to do. And I don't mind doing, which is jawbone on Saturday morning, shotgun Saturday. So if you haven't already done so, uh, I, I tweeted a visual aid. I'll be referring to certain things so that way you, know, you can look at it while I'm talking about it. And I'll cue you up when to look at it specifically. But it's a chart that I tweeted as a visual aid. It's essentially the entirety of Friday's trading. And that way we can uh, look at a couple of things and I'll share some market wizardry with you. But. The discussion today is order flow and uh, live price action. And you probably heard and seen and witnessed a, a great deal of things this week that were hopefully inspiring to you and encouraging, and hopefully also communicating that there is no noise or randomness in price action, even on a one minute chart. So I promised you last year that I'd sit down. And I'd show you and walk through every individual one minute candle, explain what it should do, what it should not do. And that way it'll help you grow familiar with order flow without any other assistance, no other kind of gimmick that is used in trading, you know, depth of market, ladders and volume profile, all those things. And please, when I say that, I'm showing you a stark contrast to using tools that are outside of just naked price action. I'm not kind of being, is, uh, in some respects, it sounds like I'm being disrespectful. While I do hold no affinity for any of, the, any of those quote unquote tools, I know that there are students even in my own group that utilize them and have you know, a, a place in their heart for using it. Okay, it's fine. But there is no necessity to use those tools. So when you see me dress my chart up and put I put what, what I call as lipstick on it, um, it may be simply a rectangle as a visual aid, and or I'll put little line segments in there, basically drawing reference to a liquidity pool above an old high, below an old low, and or like a fair value gap or volume imbalance, something to that effect. Other than that, there's really nothing on my chart, and. And this week, we covered several things intraday. I talked about 
again, and utilize the importance of knowing what that new week opening gap is. And that is always going to be Friday's closing price to whatever the opening price is on Sunday. And it's just really interesting to see how everyone's like really alert to it now because it's been there the whole time. But none of you have paid any attention to it. It's hidden because it's not based on some kind of indicator. So you can see how we've been in consolidation. And I'm speak I'm speaking specifically as it relates to the S&P market. But largely, the market as a whole is in a consolidation. And we're likely to stay in that consolidation for um, a number of weeks, maybe a month or two. And that's okay. It's fine. And I think everyone's watching a little bit closer about what's going on with Russia. And we may see some kind of escalation and all that stuff. And if it does occur, that's going to cause the markets to get really animated, which is great in that regard. But it's bad because you know, nobody wants to see anybody hurt or killed because of a war event. But unfortunately, one of the things that you have to come to terms with as a speculator is we can't control adverse things and famine and war and pestilence, disease and death. We can't stop that. But we can take that storm and go into it and say, okay, well, where's the rainbow after all the, you know, the, the deluge? Okay, you look for the silver lining. And it's one thing to fall victim to that. But it's also empowering for someone to be able to say, okay, this is terrible. It's hard. You can't stop it. You can't change it. You can't do anything that you divert it from occurring if it does. So I don't have a problem. I have no moral conflict with profiting from it as a catalyst in the marketplace. Now, some of you might think, whoa, you know, you're you're evil. <laughs> you're evil because you're you're trying to make money off of pain and suffering and death. No, actually, I'm not. I'm I'm taking advantage of price fluctuations. In the beginning, I was thinking to myself, wow, is this a Christian type thing to do? You know, I, I know that this is probably the root cause for all of this volatility. You know, when crops go bad, when I was a commodity trader, you know, I didn't wish a drought, but if it occurred, guess what happens in the green markets? They go vertical, straight up. And those types of moves, you want to be able to participate in. In speculation, uh, you're going to be met with a lot of psychological and emotional barriers. And by me sitting with you, showing you every individual candle painting, explaining what I would like to see, what I don't want to see, and then being met with the reality of what the market's actually going to do, it helps you frame a mindset. And that mindset needs to be guarded. That means your attention needs to be guarded. So when you're looking at social media, like when I'm tweeting, if I'm calling the market through Twitter, which I don't think I'm going to do very much more of, I've really grown comfortable with the idea of doing the live streams because I don't have to do any kind of real heavy editing. So we'll probably see more of that kind of stuff and less of the pre-recorded uh, recordings. So I'm sure you're probably all happy about that, but it helps me with my time and time management at home. But watching me outline and give commentary over top of you know, live data, it will help you if you don't look at social media. And if you are tweeting to me or trying to get my attention, and I'm not seeing you, I'm not going to see your tweet. I'm not going to be looking at social media. And I, I don't have a chat window on my live stream for my personal guarding of my attention because I know I'm invariably going to get some kind of asshole that show up and want to get attention for themselves. Um, I, I don't care. You you make a case for what you saw me do in a live stream. Okay. Just, you know, I guess go in there and disprove it. Have fun trying, but you know, that that's not my focus right now. I'm trying to get through this year and I want to be able to invest as much as I can into you before we get to the end of the year. And I'm having fun doing it. Hopefully you guys are as well, but I covered the new week opening gap uh, for a couple of weeks now. Uh, my, Private students have known this. We've, we've talked about this as kind of like a charter level education. And they, as charter members, 
they're learning equally just like you are. I'm expounding on something that I introduced to them. And now you're seeing the fruits of understanding what that is and what it can bring to you in terms of knowing what price is likely to do next with a great deal of probability. And what is that? I mentioned that the new week opening gap, which is the closing price of Friday, the previous Friday, and the opening price on Sunday, that range, whichever higher, Friday's close or Sunday's opening, and the midpoint, which is consequent, consequent encroachment. You want to extend those levels through the entirety of the week. Now, here's another factor. You want to use that same opening range for every week that starts in, the, in that same month. The algorithm will refer back to that within the same month. Now, there's a little bit of an overlap, too. What happens if you're using, for instance, like we're in the first and second week of February? Are we just using two? No. You go back as much as four weeks because there's going to be rotation that the algorithm is going to refer back to. It's not always looking at the calendar dates like we would look at. Like when January closes, stop right now. This is a reminder because I know some of you are just kicking back, eating potato chips pork rinds, getting ready for the big game this week, and you're just chilling with ICT. If you're not writing this stuff down, you're wasting your time. You're not going to remember it. You will not remember it. So make sure you have something to write with and record what I'm saying. But you're having basically a rolling four-week look back. It will, by default, encapsulate a monthly rotation in order flow that the algorithm will refer back to. What I mean by that? The opening, new week opening gap starting like this week coming here when we see the opening price on sunday we are looking back the last four weeks so there's going to be four weeks of new week opening gaps on a chart you want to save a profile or a workspace or whatever else you would call it on, on a platform that's outside of trading view whatever that medium is that you save your your charts on you want to set up a, t a template that is for new week opening gaps. And you wanna have the last four. Now, obviously you'll have a fifth because you're starting with a new week. So right away, you're probably thinking, oh, this is gonna be a lot of stuff on my chart. It's actually not, it's actually not at all. So it gives you a X-ray view of how the algorithm will refer back to old areas of real fair value. That's not to diminish fair value gaps because Fair value is an evolving factor and principle in order flow. Now, when I say order flow, I am not referring to some kind of look inside the candlestick. If you're using this kind of chart, you're an idiot because I used to work at Berkeley's or Barclays or whatever it is. <laughs> You've seen that guy on there on YouTube. I, he's always on my videos now. His ads are running on my stuff. But you don't need to have volume or the number of contracts recorded or shown inside of every individual candle. That's irrelevant. You don't need to know that. That is not necessary. But if you want to subscribe to that and believe that fairy tale that that sounds going to help you, you're welcome to do that. Go right ahead. But that is absolute bullshit. You don't need anything like that at all. You're looking for levels of premium to discount, time-oriented, concepts and entry points and targets inefficiency in price and liquidity now you can also create a template for your new day opening gaps and what is that that is the difference between the 5 p.m closing price on the s p this is also for dow futures and nasdaq futures and any index really that closes between five o'clock and reopens at 6 p.m Eastern time. So the distinction for new day opening gap, which is always going to be abbreviated as N D O G. I'm sitting here. I'm trying to think that I'm saying it right. This is one of those things that you'd never see in the, the recording. So I'll go back and edit it. I'll hit control M. I was literally my fingers were reaching for the control tab and looking for, for M because that gives me a marker on my recordings and I can go back and fix those things. But uh, 
new day opening gap is the difference between the closing price at 5 p.m. Eastern time, or just simply whatever the local time is in New York. That's why you need to have a, a clock set to New York time and your trading view charts should be defaulted to New York time. Everything revolves around New York time. And that sounds like a typical American thing. Oh, you guys are arrogant. You think everything revolves around you. Well, the fucking markets do, okay? And that's just the way it is. I'm sorry. It, I, you know, if it was revolving around India time, I wouldn't give a fuck. I would just be trading it based on that's what it is. But I'm telling you, that's what it's revolving around. So 5 p.m. closing price and 6 p.m. opening price. That's your new day opening gap, that range. And you want to extend that out. Now, you want to do that for like the week and the week before. That's about as far as, in, in my opinion, I'm only interested in that. So you're going to have as much as 10 of them on your chart. You don't want anything else on that template, just that. And you will see by having a template like that and also a template that has the new week opening gaps where there's nothing else on the chart. Because if you're trying to bring everything to your chart, you're going to look like you're doing what everybody else in retail trading does. They plaster all this stuff. You ever see those people that uh, decorate their lawns for Christmas? When I grew up, <laughs> we had several homes in the neighborhood that they brought everything out. And you, could, you couldn't even see their lawn at all. It was all these like, little inflatable things or plastic ornaments that light up and whatever. It was, it was too much stuff. Well, you don't want to clutter your charts up like that. You want to be able to see price and time and also how it reaches into these areas of real fair value. You'll be... Surprised to see how markets reach back to them, turn, gravitate back to them, turn, go through them, act as support, go through them, come back and act as resistance. You'll see real order flow. And it's really a fascinating study. And I don't want you to just take my word for it. I want you to look at it, study it. When the weekend, go back and see how the market referred back to those price points. When didn't it respect it? When it didn't respect it, was it? on the heels of a market report that was high impact or medium impact. All those things are important for you to journal. So when you're, I guess, screenshotting or if you're printing, which I think is extremely expensive today anymore, when you're buying ink, it's better just to have in, uh, in that opinion, in my opinion rather, for keeping screenshots and, and annotations, it's better to screenshot because it's more economical to do that. But I like on the weekend, I'll print one chart out. And it's basically what I just shared with you. So what I do is I refer to that and then I literally pencil in, not pen, pencil in things that I liked seeing about price action. One, one or two things that I was expecting that didn't pan out and anywhere that I would have taken a trade that was wrong. If I get stopped out, if I miss a trade, if it doesn't fill my limit order to get into a move, then I'll write down my observations and you know, my thoughts about it. I don't go in and say, shit, I missed this fucking move. Why did I not do that? Ugh. That's frustration. You don't want to record frustration. You want everything. You want to be writing a love letter to yourself. Every single time you're journaling, you're encouraging that inner trader to come forth. You want to, you want to manifest that positive thought, principle-oriented, analyst-supported speculator. And you want to stomp the shit out of the gambler that's inside of you that wants to well up all the time and push the button just to see what would happen. So you're, you're constantly balancing all that stuff. But I usually print a one-minute chart like that because I don't need to have a 15-minute chart. I don't need to see a five-minute chart because you can see every turning point with that one-minute chart. But you can also see much more details in the order flow. And I only brought out, in my opinion, some of the, the salient points, which is also what was making its way into my live streams so you can see what i was referring to points of importance to me and what i felt that was algorithmic for future prognostication which was told to you real time either through twitter or when i was doing the live sessions so we'll get to that chart in a moment but for now i just want to talk a couple principles that you want to have when you go forward and you've seen me implement them this week in our first i guess hands-on over the shoulder ICT. Uh, experience with live streaming and calling the markets order flow by definition mine is reading the tape and internalizing how price is being delivered right now 
Is it in a buy program? That means it's going to continuously move towards higher prices. And that could be gravitating towards an inefficiency that's above market price or a liquidity pool above an old high or relative equal highs or multiple highs. Like we've seen this week, we've seen four intraday highs and then ran it and then went lower. Or order flow is referencing and studying price right now live. If it's in a sell model, I'm sorry, sell program where it's continuously pricing lower for a discount reaching into either a inefficiency, that's either a fair value gap or maybe a volume imbalance or an actual gap like a gap at the new day opening or a new week opening. So when I taught the PD array matrix in the core content that you can see on my YouTube channel for my private tutorship, uh, the PD array matrix, I gave out a very specific order of where certain PD arrays would usually form in their hierarchy. So the highest form of a premium array to the lowest form before you get to equilibrium, where they rank among, among themselves in the delivery usually. Volume imbalances are not in that PD array matrix. Institutional order flow entry drills are not really in that either. And new week and new day gaps don't exist in that ranking either because why? They're variable. There's no, there's no static reference point where they're going to form. It always looks like this. No, it's not true. But in a price run from an old high down to an old low, in that range, if you're working your way back up, the PD arrays form exactly like the PD array matrix I gave you in that core content. And you learn that in month five content, in case you're wondering where that's at. So just go to the month five playlist and go through that, and you'll, you'll see all that stuff there. But volume imbalances can occur anywhere in a price run. There's no hierarchy. There's no importance of it forming above or below a fair value gap or a um, breaker. It, can, and it literally can form anywhere. And these gaps, because nobody, not even me, nobody knows where a new day is going to open at 6 p.m. No one knows where the market's going to open up on Sunday. So because those are variables in price action and price delivery, you have no idea what they're going to do. You don't know if there's going to be a bomb dropped on some country that's going to cause everybody to wig out and cause all kinds of panic. And then excitement is going to be used. And they'll open the price up extremely far away from the last closing price on Friday. And they will inspire and, quote unquote, engage and engineer sentiment. So when we're looking at order flow, we're referencing what the retail trader may be expecting in price action based on what books and theory they use, what they're looking for for price patterns, you know, like bull flags and head and shoulders and stuff like that. We don't like those patterns. I am teaching you not to draw any affinity for those things, except for taking advantage of being against that principal idea. When there's a wrestling match between smart money and retail price patterns like that and harmonic patterns and things like that, they will lose. They will lose every single time if it's against a smart money idea. Now, when that wrestling match begins, you may or may not know at that moment that you should be expecting or anticipating it because you're relatively new. That's the benefit of seeing it over my shoulder. When I'm showing my charts and I'm talking over top of it, I'm giving you that three years, I'm some three decades and 30 years of experience reading price action. You're seeing it through my eyes and I'm doing my best and I may not be effective you know, as much as I'm hoping to be uh, as far as articulating what should be happening next and what's going on but over the year you know listening to your feedback and such i'll, I'll use it con constructively if it's respectfully given to me but there's also limitations as far as I'm, where i'm going to go and what i'm going to do so but real time watching price and as price is moving up let's go back to that analogy of we're 
looking for higher prices, let's assume for that moment. Price is likely to go higher. It's going up to a premium level. It's going to a, a buy side liquidity pool. It's obvious the market wants to get up there. It just keeps pressing higher, higher, higher. And what we're looking at for order flow is do every PD array that I would teach you and what you see me reference in real time, one minute charts, is it providing support? Is it preventing price from going below three PD arrays? A buy program where markets are bullish and we're looking for price to continuously deliver. Delivering is constantly booking and printing new higher highs, not higher highs like in think in like uh, market structure, like you see people teaching market structure, higher highs, higher lows, higher highs. Fuck that. That's too simplistic. That is not what I'm teaching you. You don't ever hear me teaching higher high, higher low bullshit. Okay. That's right out of retail books. Stop that. It's understandable and it's introductory. That's great. What I'm talking about is does does each individual candle when it expands higher, when you're bullish and you're watching that buy program unfold and it's digging in to higher prices and just keeps printing and creeping and, and creeping up and encroaching on that old high where buy side liquidity pool is resting, where real buy stops are resting. I'm teaching you to look at every individual candle and how it relates to the candles just before it. So it's going to create a little small little stair step. And every little candle should support the new one. Every down close candle, I'm looking at that. This is the, the, the primary function of how I teach order flow. A bullish market, when the market rallies and way and it's reaching to buy side liquidity, I'm watching does the down close candles support price? That's the that's a primary obs observation for me. I'm looking at that. By itself, that's going to serve you better than any of the bullshit out there you're looking at. You're looking at level two data, you're looking at, you know ladders and depth of market and volume profile all that stuff is distracting you from just looking at the candles themselves because they're going to tell you everything you need to see and it won't divert or dilute your attention you're simply looking at how are the candles relating to one another is it continuously giving you constructive feedback that you are on side and expecting higher prices now that's not to say that you won't see a break lower that comes back for a short term low and takes out a, a pool of short-term sell stops. That's that's normal. That's absolutely normal, which is why I teach how you are not to be in a rush to move your stop loss. That's the number one reason why I tell you not to be in a hurry to move that stop loss up. I'm training you to trust and have conviction about where the market's going to go. Your safety net is your stop. But you don't need to have the safety net and training wheels and harnesses all around you because you're going to be too afraid to trade then. You have to step out there and embrace that uncertainty. By watching the candles print, and that's essentially booking price, when that higher price is expected, that's gravitating towards, that buy stops, every down close candle should support any return back on the new candle or a future candle that would trade down into it. It's going to expand higher and then pull back a little bit, expand higher and pull back a little bit. And the narrative behind what price is doing, you can read that and internalize how all the real order flow is coming in. I don't need a fucking chart to tell me how many orders were at every price level inside that candle. That's too much. That's too much information for me. I don't give a shit. I'm reading what the market's going to, I'm already going to know what the fuck they're going to be doing. I'm telling you that they're going to be buying here. Just listen to my commentary when the candles are forming. All right. It's going to go down here. It's going to stop here. I don't need to know what the numbers are. Just like those reports. Who gives a shit what they say about the data? I don't give a fuck how many people lost their job. I don't know how many people's going to get a job. The, the employment data, it's all bullshit. It's old anyway. You can't do anything with that. So why waste your time with all that? It's extra shit. Focus on what matters most. That means the price right now. And as long as price is moving in the direction that you expect it to go to, down closed candles are supporting price. Now they can go through them. When would we expect price to go through them and not freak out? If there's a fair value gap, if there's a short term low that has recently formed, and we are not in the upper quarter of where the price should go to for target. 
Let me say that again slowly so that we understand what I'm referring to. If you believe that you have figured out where the low is in the market for this uh, particular price swing, and you think it's going to go up to an old high where buy stops and buy side liquidity is, that midpoint of that run, that's that will be equilibrium. Now, that range is not really there yet. You're just implying that that's where it's going to likely go. So therefore, between where you think the beginning point of that run is, the low, you may or may not actually be in the move yet. But assuming that you are or aren't, who cares? The midpoint of that, that equilibrium price point, at that point or below it, that's where your best buys are going to occur. But now, as soon as we get to the upper quarter of where that target is, you're going to see less likely retracements to a, a stop that would be below old lows. Like in other words, the market's not, not likely to go back for sell stops. Now it can, it can, but largely it doesn't. And this is getting back to when I was teaching you this week how to, when you're pyramiding and you're adding more to a, a winning trade and you're building your positions up, as soon as you cross the threshold of the opposing side of that discount to premium or premium to discount range, and we're going to use the, the analogy I'm talking here, we are in a buy program. That means they're expecting higher prices. It's going to go to a premium inefficiency fair value gap or an old high to run out stops. So that's the magnet. That's the draw on liquidity. So as the market goes higher, whether you got in at the low that started that price run or didn't, you got to know exactly where to go back to to see the beginning of that move. So that point of inception and where your target is, which is terminus, between those two price points is equilibrium. That's where the difference between discount to premium, it, that's where it starts and ends. But if you go halfway between equilibrium to your target, which is terminus, that's in premium range, not discount. In other words, think of it like now we're overbought. I'll, I'll talk to the folks in here that are used to listening to and understanding retail logic. As soon as we get to the final quarter of the run that gets to the target, as soon as we get into that vicinity in terms of the price run or, or range of how far it's been moving up, it's less likely to see a stop run below old lows. Why would it be like that? Because it's going to be in a hurry to run out the buy stops because they may catch wind about what's likely to occur. You know what it's like to be short and your stop sitting above an old high. You're praying, you become a Christian then, don't you? <laughs> you're looking for Allah, you're looking for Jesus, you're looking for whoever. Somebody answer me. You, you become religious then, even the atheist starts praying. Because you know, as, as it's getting closer to your stop, it's likely to do what? Run for it. And that's why the market is less likely, not that it's impossible to do so, but it's less likely for it to come back against you and run sell stops before it runs to your target. Because it's going to be in a hurry to reprice because it doesn't want to give the opportunity for those orders to be pulled, close the trade and collapse and, and reduce the amount of liquidity for smart money traders. That's why the algorithm is coded that way. It's coded to do that very thing because right about those highs, it is not aware of the human, the human aspects of, oh no, I'm scared, let me just close my trade and protect the stop for those that are smart. It just knows that once we get to that last quarter of the price run, accelerate, boom, 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 boom. That's why you see me talking about, and you see me here now this week, and you watch me do recordings of executions. I'm looking for speed. I'm looking for the you know, big range candles, expand up and run into that liquidity, pow. That is a purge of liquidity. Stop calling it a liquidity grab. That pisses me off. <laughs> it's not what it is. It's a purge of liquidity. So order flow, we're looking at how those candles support one another and how if there's any retracement, it's only going to retrace down to the nearest fair value gap below price. Well, we're, we're in a buy program and it's moving higher, reaching for buy side liquidity. Or every down close candle will support price. Everything I just said, reverse it when you're looking for lower prices. Every up-close candle should resist price from going any higher. Now, it does not mean that 
up close candles while the market's bearish can't be breached and traded above. Because if there's a fair value gap above it, it's reasonable to expect that. It doesn't undermine the efficacy of what I'm teaching you. It just means that the market's going to go back and offer fair value to the marketplace, which is going to be identified by you as a smart money trader as a new opportunity to add or enter. If you haven't been a participant in the trade yet, that could be your invitation and, and means of uh, accumulating a short position at that moment and not be in the best case entry point. And that best case entry point is relative. Even though everybody wanted to like to say, okay, I want to get in at the very low and buy that low, your skill set may not permit that yet. So don't rush that. And I'm seeing folks, you know, bitch and complain about how they are frustrated because they can't get their trade on. You're not supposed to be trading right now. You're not supposed to be trading right now. And you're not listening. You're not listening to my videos. You're not listening to me in the live streams. You're not listening to this when I'm talking to you here. This is the, in these Twitter spaces, I'm taking you to the woodshed. You're not going to like how I talk to you, but I'm talking to you like a trainer. I'm talking to you like your father. I'm talking to you like your best friend that wants you to do well. And I'm trying to have an intervention here because you're fucking up when you push the button to enter trades while I'm doing what I'm doing. You're not learning anything. And the proof is you're complaining <laughs> because you're complaining about and worrying about that your trade didn't get put on instead of understanding what I'm teaching you, watching and observing that. And seeing what it is that you're supposed to glean from these lessons, not to simply, well, you know, he said basically to pick these lottery numbers and I'm going to do that. And that's, you're, you're doing it wrong. You're being a fool, you're being foolish, and you're being ignorant. You're extending the ignorance that you hold right now by trying to trade on what I'm telling you to look at and observe. And I mean that with every measure of love and respect. I don't want to see you waste this opportunity. And this is the first week. And already there's dozens of you that are fucking up. You're trading. You're, you're using it to use for a signal service. And that's not what I'm intending it to be. You're not going to learn the same way and have all the advantages of not having any monetary attachment. So when you're watching the life price action, you're trying to remove any desire for money. I promise you there is a stage in this year where I'm going to tell you to go in with your demo account. I'm going to tell you buy this price right here. I'm going to tell you put your limit order right here and we'll watch and see it get filled and put your stop loss right here and we're going to do this run to this objective here. That is not an invitation for you to use the live account. I'm telling you if you listen to me and do exactly what I tell you to do and avoid the things I'm telling you to avoid, you will get the best learning experience you would ever get, ever. But some of you just don't want to listen. And it frustrates me, which is why, again, I've been saying, if you've made money taking trades on this shit, don't share it with me. I don't want to know because this makes me angry. It pisses me off, to, to be honest with you, because you're not listening. And you have to listen. This is important. I'm only going to do it this year. So if you don't take advantage of it now and watch price and understand what it is it's, it's so supposed to do and not worry about how much money you're going to make and get funded or pass your funded challenges, that shit's easy. Look at what I just showed you this week. Every fucking day, every morning session, every afternoon session, I gave you five handles each time or more. It doesn't stop working just because you now start trading with a live account or a funded account, but you're thinking that these candles are going to still do the same shit. They've been doing the same shit for 30 years while I've been looking at them and they were doing it before I started trading and before I was even born. So the market's going to continuously do these things. So stop feeling rushed. Take advantage of just relaxing. Unwind and enjoy the process. Don't be feeling like you, you got to have it right now. You don't have to have shit right now, but patience. So when we look at how many opportunities per week. Now this, again, in your notes, you're not inviting yourself to expect five handles every morning session 
and five handles in every afternoon session. That's too much. 50 handles a week is, that's a very busy week for someone that would be new, at least using the thresholds that I'm teaching you to work with. You've also learned, if you've been paying attention, that five handles is relatively easy to see when you know what you're looking for. But price runs can go more than that. And by doing what I'm teaching you to do, you will observe the times when it's going to be more than a five handle run. What does that mean? How do you know that? Go to the visual aid I gave you. I'll give you a moment to get that loaded up on your device or computer. I can already hear people bitching now. You should just do this on a live stream. No, you should just listen and do what I'm telling you to do. All right, so I gave you a chart of Friday's trading. And you can find that on my Twitter. It was probably what, maybe one or two, no, like two or three tweets back. It'll say visual aid. And it is the one minute chart of February 10th, 2023. And if you look at the far left, there's a dotted line says, vertical line says New York 930 opening. And on the far right hand side is a vertical dotted line that says the 4 p.m. close for New York. In between those time intervals, you're looking for five handles as your initial baseline measurement for progress. You are not to be expecting, like I'm seeing some of you, you're not to expect to be able to pick out the 4069.75 low that I annotated early in the morning before the New York session. During the London session, I was talking to everybody on Twitter. You're not expected to know the 4104.25 high. The importance is to know how many times by looking at through this entirety of price action from the low to high across the full spectrum of 930 opening to 4 p.m. close. This is the canvas that you're working with every single day. You, as the trader, need to look at this and say, what does this life that I'm leaving, living right now and leading What does it allow me to trade? Does it allow me to trade the first half of this before 12 noon New York time? And that would be the morning session. Or is it more appropriate for you to be trading in the afternoon? Either one's fine. But one doesn't have any better opportunities. They all have opportunities. But to help you frame your approach to trading and, and build a model that's unique and permissible for you, that your life and the requirements in your life will allow for you to engage. It may be that you can only do it one or two times a week. Okay, those one or two times a week is just fine. That's fine. Because once you start doing this, okay, because right now you're saying, my job, man, it just won't let me do it. You know, I have school. You know, uh, my wife doesn't really support this idea yet. My husband he thinks this is bullshit. I'm not going to try to convince him because I tried. He, he won't let me do it. And you don't have much time. Okay, that's fine. All that shit goes away when you start making money. Okay. Once you see that you can pull these, these setups and, and opportunities out of the marketplace consistently, your job that you think is the most important thing right now that controls every aspect of your time, that shit's going to fall secondary. You're thinking right now, yeah, I'd like to learn how to trade, but you know, I got this job. I'm afraid to lose everything. I'm afraid to you know, take a, a risk. And Okay, entrepreneurs, here's the difference between an entrepreneur and someone that's going to be in the rat race forever. The entrepreneur tests to see if there's opportunity. Once the entrepreneur sees there's valid evidence to support that they can absolutely be profitable doing it, the job that they hold as their shield, their their pillar of insurance 
they hold on to that. That's their that's their fortress and high tower they run into when things get rough. At least I have my job. Fuck that shit. That job is not guaranteed. Just like your next trade isn't a guarantee in winning. But see, you think that your job, that's a safe thing. That's a fortress of solitude. It is a bunch of shit. It's slavery. They have literally brainwashed you into thinking that that is what you should accept and i'm telling you that's not what you should be accepting you're being limited your entire your entire life is being held back because of that fucking job you can only make what that person that employs you tells you you're going to make you can't make any more than that unless they're nice to you and this is what they've been teaching you if they're nice to you and they let you get some fucking overtime so you can make the christmas bills that you create for yourself <laughs> I know I used to do the same shit beg and plead hey can I have some extra hours can I please slave for less than I'm really you know should be expecting as income let me prostitute my time some more and be away from my family some more for a little bit more money for one and a half times of the bullshit pennies that you give me when you start seeing that you can do this that fucking job is going to be secondary now and that's exactly what you want you want to do everything that beefs up and fortifies what you're doing as an investor because as an investor there is no ceiling there is no limit that you can say okay this is as much as i can earn who says that who says that you can't do that who says that you can't make ten thousand dollars a month who says you can't make ten thousand dollars a week who the fuck said you can't make ten thousand dollars a trade who's saying you can't the only person that can stop it is you you the same person that's saying you know i don't like having to go to work but man i'm glad i got my job right now what would i do if i didn't have my job what the fuck would you do if you didn't have your job and you're earning money from your investments that's the question you should be asking flip it instead of saying what would i do if i lost my job that's an abusive relationship and you're fucking holding on to it you need to look at this chart right now one of these two areas in the day that's your home that's where you're going to start at your at your next home that you're going to move into mentally psychologically and you're going to live there you're not going to give a fuck what the neighbors are doing in the morning session if you're trading the afternoon if you're trading the morning session you don't give a fuck what your neighbors are doing in the afternoon session you're picking one you're going to become a specialist in this in that specific time of the day and you're going to look for five handles this is how you progress this is how you go forward observing price action and keeping in mind what a five handle run looks like and you're not going to be limited to five handles. You will learn how to do 20 handle moves, 50 handle moves, and like you've seen me many, many times execute on over 100 handles. One trade, full pull, no partials. Partials are for you. They're for you. They're like training wheels. I don't need to take partials. My trades are better selected when I can see partials there. That way, if something comes in where I can see maybe something's coming into uh, the news wires. We're all some un unannounced event. Oh, you know, Biden's got a, uh, you know, he's going to have a unannounced press conference. Oh, shit. What's this fucker going to talk about? Then I can look to say, okay, let me scale some of this stuff out at logical places that would be profitable for me. But my trades don't. I don't need to be taken off partials. I explain and show you that because you aren't me. You don't have 30 years experience. You don't know and how to trust and have the conviction to hold to your target. I do. I'm going to teach you how to do that, but I can't teach you to do full pulls on your trades when you haven't even learned how to, number one, master yourself, get yourself in a position that you can be trained and learn. And then you start small. Five handles is easy. Five handles replaces your fucking job. I don't care what you make. You can be a surgeon. I have them. Five handles, you can make more than that surgeon earns in a year. All the heavy lifting is done by money management. You just need to have the cookie cutter that repeats over and over and over again. This thing that you keep doing, that's your multiplier. Five handles right now is easy for you to learn to do. It's not easy when you first start. But if you look at these price ranges, 
in the morning session and the afternoon session, there's several five handle runs in there. Easy ones. The problem is you want more right now. You're holding yourself to an expectation that you are not realistically going to meet. And then you're wondering why you're depressed and anxious. You're feeling rushed. You're weighing yourself against what you think you should know by now. And that's bullshit. There's only been one week. One week, and you think you're supposed to quit your job and be able to double your fucking account in, in a month. That's not practical, man. Or lady. It's not something that you should be aspiring to do right now. Can you do that and eventually over time? Sure you can. Absolutely. Let it be a goal that you work towards, but you have to place time and experience and invite the opportunity for that experience to come in and build before you take on those monumental projects and goals for yourself. But the first thing you're trying to learn how to do now is find the setups that repeat. And then once you find that one that repeats, you will learn how to trust it because you see it happening every day. Every day it'll be there. I promise you, Scouts Honor, you will see a fucking five handle run every day, every day. Every fucking day, if that market's open, five fucking handles is laid in front of you every single day on a silver platter. You just can't identify it right now. And that's absolutely normal. That's normal. There's no reason to be anxious about that. But at some point, you may be forced to make changes in your personal life to be able to do this. I did. I had to. I had to work two part time jobs to get the difference between what I was earning at my full-time job. It's a lot. One job was across town, one was real close to my home. One paid next to nothing, but those hours were permissible because of the times I'm, I'm trying to trade. And I was trying to do that morning session with the bond market. That's what I was trying to trade. That was, that was the thing that I was working towards. And I had to give up you know, my, my job so I could be in front of the chart to do that. It's scary, yes, but I didn't do it blindly. I said, I'm going to do this now because I have all this back testing. I've all this forward testing. I have the data to support the fact that I know I can make $1,000 a week in bonds. And I don't need to trade every single day. I'm looking for that one trade for that one week. I'm teaching you how to see this every day. That builds confidence real quick, real quick, but not to inspire overconfidence. Not, I'm quitting my fucking job tomorrow, man. I'm ready. You got me all hyped up now. No, I'm aligning your perspective and aligning your thoughts with what it is I'm trying to put you through. So that way the experience itself will be the educator. I'm just the coach. I'm putting you in front of the charts when the, the setups are going to form. Trusting that your observation skills, which are hopefully menial, they're just that's the app. If you can read, okay, and if you can observe, you'll see it. It'll be there. It'll jump off the chart. Right now, it probably doesn't jump off the chart. I mean, you can see where I'm annotating the charts in the morning session. You can see what I've annotated in the afternoon. Those annotations were real time. They they're not added after the fact. So when I talk about what the charts are likely to do, what the next candles and what series of candles and what it should perform, going higher or lower, don't go lower than this, go here, stop, maybe retracing consolidate and go up here next or go down here next. All of that is experience. That part, that part comes to you over time. How much time? You're, you're all going to learn that differently. Some of you are going to warm up to it real fast and get a feel for reading order flow quick. And some of you are going to require a little bit more time. Do not fault yourself for that. Chances are you're probably just worrying about things and what if thinking. What if I don't get this as soon as I want to? What if, you know, I lose my job now and I wasn't worried about that. Now fucking ICT is giving me a complex and I'm having a phobia about losing my job now. Good. You should be afraid of losing your job. You absolutely should be afraid of losing your job because you're not essential. You're not. You can be made redundant real quick. So you have to have a way of being able to do what? Because if you lost your job, let's just say it like this. If you lose your job, they fired you. 
you go in on Monday and they say, hey, look, and you're, you're sacked. You're out of here. Here's your pink slip. Goodbye. What the hell? They don't care. They don't care that you have children. They don't care that you have student debt. They don't care that your mortgage went up because they raised property taxes. They don't give a shit. But what are you forced to do then? Go out there and look for another job. That may require you to do a different work schedule, work load, skills that you aren't really that good at yet, but you got to go through the stress of going through it. Why? Because you got to earn money. Okay. The money that's available in these marketplaces, why is that any different? All you're doing is going through the training process to get your certificate, your degree, your diploma. That's what you're here for this year. Some of you want to walk out and be a fucking surgeon just because you read Grey's Anatomy. That's not practical. You can't, you can't do that, folks. And this, this is really technical. And it's very hard. And you're wrestling with the brightest minds in the entire world. And they're trying to beat you. They're making it almost impossible if you use retail stuff. Because those things, they're distractions. And all I'm asking you to do is really look at this chart and figure out where, and don't use these individual swings to justify either. Think about where you are in your personal life. What changes are you comfortable with making to allow yourself to be in these markets watching it live? Two and a half, three hours of, of a day, a couple times a week, that's all you need. Because one good setup per week can replace your entire work week and what you earn. It doesn't feel like that, but it, it's exactly what it is. And when you can repeat it, Every week, it compounds. And then because you can do that, your confidence level, your trust in yourself and what you're, learn, what you're learning and what you have learned will repeat. Then you're willing to do what? What an entrepreneur does, expand. Make more changes to allow for this to completely and utterly replace your job. But that doesn't happen right away. You can't try to force that to be immediate or overnight. And I know that's not what you want to hear, but it's what you need to hear. You need to understand that because you're going to hold yourself back by having that mindset instead of just simply saying, okay, I'm rolling my sleeves up. I'm committing this entire year. It's less than a four-year degree, but you're going to make more than any PhD, any master in business. Because there's no limit to this. You pour as much as you want to pour into this, and you get what you get put in. You put shit at, and you half ass attempts to do it. Don't be upset when you get half ass results. You're going to lose money when you're doing it, just like when you lose money when you don't make the work. You get sick, you lose money. Your kid gets sick, you got a medical bill. Well, that's a, that's a loss. You don't look at it like that, but that's exactly what it is. So there's all these ex perfect excuses that you're using to not do what's required to be successful in speculation. But if you look at these individual candles here, every individual candle represents one minute of time. What's the highest high of that one minute interval? What's the lowest low? Where is the opening price of that one minute candle? Where's the closing price of that? That's the only thing you're concerned about, and time. You can see, obviously, you know the highs and lows. If you're looking at your chart, okay, uh, Patrick, uh, Patrick Whelan, I'm, I'm, I'm saying this to you. When you're showing your charts and when you're looking at charts, you want to have this much on your chart. I know you're probably zoomed in to help your viewers look at it but if you're not looking at your entire day like this and the rest of you also when i'm looking at my one minute charts i have a one minute chart that's just like this i have a lot of screens but if you're looking at price and you don't have this much real estate in terms of the candles you don't have enough you're you're too zoomed in and it's like looking at the forest with their with your nose right on the tree that you're closest to. Can you see the forest? No. So you have to be able to see and internalize where liquidity is. 
Where is the morning session highs? Where is the morning session lows? Where's equilibrium on the range that's already been formed for the day? Where's the liquidity pool that's just beyond what your, sh what your chart's showing right now because you're too zoomed in and you're surprised? Like, oh shit, what just happened? Why the hell did that just happen? Where did that move come from? I, you're never going to hear me say, and you've watched me do it now. Do you ever hear me say or hear me show a manager like, oh, what the fuck? Oh, shit. Where the fuck did that come from? I'm not surprised. I'm not fucking surprised. I'm expecting. I'm anticipating. I'm already in the future waiting for price to get to where I am. You're going to get to that point, too. You're not going to be surprised. You're not going to be gasping in panic and having anxiety attacks because you're watching real-time price action. You want to anticipate how price is going to deliver based on the concepts that I'm sharing with you. And over time, you're going to get better at this than you probably expect to. And that's going to be a wonderful testimony that I can't wait to hear from you when you share it. So let's get into the details here and give you some, uh, some practical things to look for. Obviously, you know, I gave you the uh, 4069.75 low in the London session, near the end of the London session on Friday before New York session even began. And I'll show you that all that detail in the analysis in the charts on Sunday. So that way I'll show you where that price level came from and why I felt confident in even sharing it with you. And then now I'm going to talk about the uh, 41025 level, 4101.5 level, the 4104 level, and the 41050. That is a layered area of liquidity above what? If you look at the 130 highs and in your chart, it's going to be real close to where I have where it says high of day. Go down a little bit to there's a little red line and go to the right end of that red line segment. That high right there at 1330, which is 130 New York local time. That high is relatively equal to that of the high that was formed between 10 o'clock and 1030 in the left hand side where it says buy side liquidity. The fact that the 1330 high running above 4100 breached the high that was formed between 10 o'clock and 1030 on the left hand side where I have buy sell liquidity, that in itself is too shallow of a run. Notice how it just went up there a couple times at around 130, ahead of 130. Just a few candles went up there. And then we moved from that high down to around 40.82 at uh, 2.30 in the afternoon. See that? When that retraced, I had a stop loss on my one singular account or one singular contract in my account. And it went to 40.84.50. That was where my stop loss was. And I was willing to let it come all the way back down there or see my limit order filled at 4101.50. Now, the high of the day, right around that 130 high, was exactly 4101.50. But the, the difference between the bid and the ask wasn't allowing that limit order to be filled. So the lines portion of the trade that was taken and accumulated around that the largest rectangle that's pink between 12 o'clock and one o'clock, I was going long in all that. Using that fair value gap high as support, expecting it to rally, and then using the longest blue rectangle in the left-hand side of the chart between 11 o'clock and 13 or one o'clock. Waiting for that to see price rip through that and attack the, the buy side liquidity resting around 40.95. And it dug into that and then reached up above the highs that was formed between 10 o'clock and 10.30 in the morning. That shallow little run and that deep retracement all the way back down into 
4082 and a half or so, whatever it was. Basically the 1430 low. 230 low in New York local time. I felt that we would potentially run that 4100 a little bit more meaningfully because it's Friday. Because they left those highs, because the bump above it at 130, which is the 1330 time at the bottom of that chart, it only went above it a little bit. So because that's a high of day, and it was only ran out shallow, little 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 bit above the previous high it was formed at 10, 1030. That means there's going to be what? Traders feeling very confident that it's not going to go up there. So what's going to be residing above that? Buy side. More buy side. And it's going to be above the high that forms at 1330 or 130 in the afternoon, New York local time. So we would be expecting it to go above that. So now fast forward to 1430 in time at the bottom of the chart. That's 130 New York local time. That low at 1430, which is around the price level of almost 4082.00. The high prior to that low, which forms between 1400 and 1430 for time, so 1 o'clock and 1.30, I'm sorry, 2 o'clock and 2.30, there's a short-term high that formed around 4.090 price level. This would have been so much better if you just would have done this on a live stream. I know, I hear you bitching. This is better for you to learn this way. I'm putting you in the chart instead of just casually Netflix watching me. That price leg from 40.90 or thereabouts between 2 o'clock and 2.30, which is represented in this chart by 1400 to 1430 in the time axis at the bottom of the chart. So price level 4090 high down to the low at 1430 or 230 in time at 4082. I think it's a quarter there as the price low. If you take your Fibonacci on your charts, and this part may not be applicable for you, but you want to write this down in your journal because you want to test this now. That low up to that short-term high, so the low at 1430 time or 230 to the high formed between 2 o'clock and 230, if you take your FIB and anchor it to the low all the way up to that high and use your FIB projections, and what projections are they? I've already shared it multiple times on the uh, Twitter, and I've also shared it multiple times on my videos. You're going to be placing it at the low at 4082.00, and that candle's low is going to be exactly at 14 colon 31. Okay, so 231 New York local time. And you're going to drag the Fibonacci up to the high on the 216 high, or in this candle, or in this chart, it would be 14 colon 16 candle. And it would be anchored to the price level exactly at 4090.75. In your Fibonacci, you're going to have settings set to negative 0 0.5, negative 1, negative 1.5 and on that price run from that low up to the high you're measuring expansion and you want to see standard deviation from that price leg i'm going to tell you why i'm picking that but just for now do what i'm telling you to do and stop worrying about anything else the one i'm sorry the negative 1.5 level is the only standard deviation that is above or the very first one above the relative equal highs to the left notice that at 130 which would be represented by 13 colon 30 on the time axis at the bottom of the chart those highs relative to the highs formed between 10 o'clock and 10 30 are relatively equal so the standard deviation between the 130 and I'm sorry, 230 and 2 o'clock high 
in the range I just gave you on the chart. Don't worry. You'll get it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send you a screenshot after I'm done this. And I probably shouldn't have said it because now you're going to get late and say, fuck it. I'm just going to not do it. And I'll look at what you share on Twitter. The first standard deviation above those relative equal highs, if we're measuring standard deviation from the low at 2.30 to the high at 2 o'clock, comes in at negative 1.5. Notice that. The price level for that standard deviation, negative 1.5, comes in exactly at 4104.00. Notice that? When I was watching and talking to everyone live streaming yesterday in the last hour of trading, I was talking about how I wanted to see those highs ran out and the buy side above that be purged. I wanted to see price go to 4102.5. And, and then I said, I wanted to see 4104. Or 4105. And if it was to get really animated, I'd like to see it rip up into 4109. The reason why I said 4104 was because of that price leg and that expansion using standard deviation. It's not cherry picked. I'm going to explain the logic. But for now, just have that on your chart. Okay. Now, if we go back to the low, you're going to start another Fibonacci overlay. So your tool for Fibonacci, you're going to take that and you're going to anchor it to the low at 1216. Okay, at 1216, that candle, that low, you're going to anchor your Fibonacci to that. And if you look to the left of that low, the high that forms inside of that fair value gap, the candle is at 12.07 or 12, seven minutes after 12 noon. The high of that candle is 4080.50. The low did your anchor to on the 12.16 candle, the low is 4072.25. <clears throat> The first standard deviation above that relative equal high, if you're anchoring from that swing, I just told you to anchor to. The first standard deviation above the morning session high between 10 o'clock and 10.30 comes in at negative 2.5. If you don't have your Fibonacci settings to have that, you just add it. And the price comes in at 4101.25. Now, I felt that we could potentially sweep above that because it's standard operating procedure to see it expand a little bit past it. So that's why I was calling 4101.50. And that's also the reason why my fill wasn't activated because of the difference between the bid and the ask. So my limit order that was sitting and residing at 4101.50, it printed that price but it didn't offer me the exit. So it went there, it had two candles, it printed it, and those candles were at 120 and 121. Those highs being at uh, 4101.50. Precision, yes, but sometimes when you're so precise, the, the downside is, is your limit orders. If you're trying to be too particular, like I was trying to be Mr. Fucking Know It All this week, <laughs> clearly. And sometimes I don't get the benefit of that precision because I'm trying to be too razor thin. That's okay. So now let's go back and look at the next high above that buy side liquidity pool from 10 o'clock and 10:30. Those highs where I have the buy side liquidity annotated on the chart, and then. The highs formed at the 130, or not really 130, 125 and 120 highs. Those two highs are relatively equal. If we were to expand further, say it was going to expand further than one, I'm sorry, 4104, where could it expand? Well, look at the first. Uh, low, we, we just anchored to from 1206, I'm sorry, 1216 candle 
the lowest one in the uh, noon hour up to the high of the candle at 1207. Okay, seven minutes after 12. That measurement we just anchored the FIB to looks straight up from there. The first standard deviation above the relative equal highs where I have the buy side liquidity pool annotated, that is negative 2.5. The next standard deviation is what? Negative three. Four one zero five point two five. So when I was talking about that live session last hour trading, how far can it go above the buy side liquidity pool? 4104. And or as much as 4105. And I was willing to eat the, the quarter point difference there because if it's expanding above the buy side liquidity, it might just get to the 4105 even level and stop there and not go to the 20, 25 quarter tick. So that's the reason why I was telling you 4104 and 4105 yesterday. And if it was the breach above 4105, then it probably could expand to 4109 which would be one point or one handle below a round number, 4110. So now we're going to get a little bit more specific. If you look at the low on 242, the low at 242, which we represented by 1442 on the chart, you're going to take your Fibonacci and anchor that low. And you're going to draw up to The high formed at 235, okay, which we represented on the chart, 1435, that time candle. The high, I'm sorry, the low that you're anchoring to on the 1442 time candle, that price comes in at 4084.75. And the high that we're anchored up to and drawn up to with your Fibonacci on the 1435 or 235 New York local time candle is 4091.25. Okay, the high is 4091.25. And your Fibonacci expansion would be first one takes you to what? Above the relative equal highs that we were aiming for, because that's the draw on liquidity. That's the whole premise of what we're looking for. How far into those pools of liquidity can we go to? Because we're not fucking trading supply and demand zones. We're not in some ambiguous area. We're looking for a scientific measurement of exactly what it should reach for. The first standard deviation above those relative equal highs is what? 4101.00, right? Nope, because the high to the left of that at 1320 or 120 in the afternoon in New York local time, that high on that candle is 4101.50. So you can't use the negative 1.5 level, which is a half a point less. So what's the first standard deviation? <laughs> negative two. What's that price? 4104.25. What's the high of the day? 41.05. I'm sorry, 41. 0.425. Now, roll back, roll back, because we just anchored that swing from the low of time candle 1442 or 242 up to the high of time candle 1435. We just measured that. Now, let's go back and do the same thing with the lunch low using the candle at 1228. So you're going to take your fib, anchor it to the low at 1228, draw the fib up to the high formed at either one of these highs at uh, 1223 or 1224 because they're both posting the same high for each candle. I have mine on the anchor to the 1225 uh, candle. And the high of that candle comes in at 4080.50. The low of the candle that you're anchored to is 4076.50. Now, straight up from there, what is the first standard deviation that you got to consider when we go above the buy side liquidity? 
it would be negative four. But look what happens when you see negative 4.5. What price level is that? 4104.25. We have two swing lows that have what? A swing low that's higher to the left and a swing low that's higher to the right. Meaning what? We're looking at real market structure. Okay. This is institutional market structure. This is how the algorithm differs to what swing high and what swing low. I know some of you are flipping the fuck out right now. Like, oh, holy shit. Yeah. Let's go deeper. We have two convergences at 4104.25 at two specific swing lows. We have a swing low at what time? What time? At 2.30. And we have the lunch low. At 1216. The 1216 low, if you just go back a little bit to the left, you'll come to the low that's formed at 1203. So the time, I'm sorry, the time candle at 1204. That low comes in at 4075.50. So you want to note that low, and then the lower low that's formed at 1216. And then there's a higher low to that low to the right of it at 1228, which is what we just measured. Do you see how that's a swing low? If we look at low, lower low, higher low, that is a fractal. It looks like an inverted head and shoulders, right? Not that I like head and shoulders patterns, but that's helping you reference that. And we have a standard deviation of negative 4.5, which calls for what price level? 4104.25. Now, applying that same logic to the low that's formed in the afternoon. Oh, ICT, you cherry pick. <laughs> Using the low at 232, measured up to the high of the candle at 1416 or 216 in time, that price swing called for what? 4104 even at negative 1.5 standard deviation we have a low that's higher than the low at 1431 that candle go to the left and you'll see the low formed at 1407 the seven minutes after two o'clock that candle which would be represented at the bottom of your chart at 14 colon 07 that low is higher than the low formed at 1431 or 31 minutes after two o'clock in New York local time. Then later on, we see what? The retracement down into the low formed at 1442 candle, 14 colon 42 or 42 minutes after two o'clock in New York local time. We measured the FIB from that low up to the high formed at the candle formed at 14 colon 35 or 35 minutes after two o'clock New York local time. Calling for what price? Standard deviation negative two, 4104.25. So we have two price levels agreeing exactly within the context of a low, a lower low, a higher low. So we have real market structure that's institutionally graded and it's calling for a very specific price level at 4104.25 that's above the buy side liquidity pool between 10 o'clock and 10.30 in New York local time. And then the high formed at 10.20, what is it, 20? Not 10, I'm sorry, uh, 13 colon 20, or 20 minutes after one New York local time. So those relative equal highs formed respectively there's going to be buy stops above that. So how far will the algorithm reach for? You just can't simply take one Fibonacci tool, lay it down on something and say, okay, here's my target. No. Look at the lesson on standard deviations for Forex, where I'm teaching in, oh, good grief. I have so many good years. I don't know exactly which one of these. I'm sure somebody in here that's been really 
astute about keeping records of where things are in my core content. Uh, I'm teaching standard deviations with the Asian range, flout, and central bank dealers range. I'm taking you to market structure here where it's not anchored to any specific time per se. It's anchored to what the market is providing in terms of structure. So if I'm bullish and I think those relative equal highs are going to be blown out later on in the afternoon, preferably the last hour of trading, three o'clock to four o'clock New York local time, or which will be represented by the, this chart, 1500 to 1400, I'm, I'm sorry, 1500 or 15 colon zero zero to 16 colon zero zero. That time of day, the last portion towards the right side of the chart. So if I'm expecting the liquidity to be drawn up into there, I don't want to just roll the dice and just say, well, you know, I don't know where it's going to go. No, I want to do some measurements because this is exactly what the algorithm is going to do. It's going to refer to these points of reference. And it takes you right to what? 4104.25. So because I fallen victim earlier in the day being trying to be Mr. Fucking everything. 4101.50, my limit order never got filled at the 130 or 120 time window. And then retrace back on my stop on the one single candle or one single contract rather. So now when I was in the afternoon session yesterday doing it live, I called for 410400 or pop up to what? 4105 even. Both of them, both of those levels were called for with the quarter point extra. So I didn't want to call that out there and be short of it because it wouldn't meet that criteria that would be an exit if you got there. You understand what that means? I'm, I'm building in the allowance for, yes, I can call that level, but it went one point or one quarter point past it and that's okay. So that's, I was trying to finesse the, the actual better pricing because I got burned early in the day because I didn't have that bid and ask difference of one quarter point to be having my limit order get me out at 41. Zero one and a half, despite calling that level being, you know, to the tick. So that's what institutional market structure is. Okay, well, institutional market structure. There is no book on it. Goldman Sachs boys don't know it. Nobody else knows it. I've taught it. Okay, because I pulled it out of the logic that the algorithm itself utilizes when it books price. I don't give a fuck. If you believe me, because I'm using it every single fucking day and to the tick precision. And I'm sorry, I got to let it out sometimes because I'm tired of seeing jokers pretending that their bullshit is what makes these markets go up and where they go to. It's all horseshit. It's doing something that it's mathematically calculating at specific elements based on what? What's the what's the primary driver here? The market's going to go up to those relative equal highs, which is exactly what I teach you to focus on initially when you're learning with me. You have to know where those areas reside first. Trying to teach this kind of lesson without you understanding why those two equal highs or relative equal highs at 1020 and 1320, why orders should reside above that. I would be unsuccessful in trying to teach that. This would be like, this is bullshit. I don't know. I'm not going to spend the time trying to learn this. But now because you know what relative equal highs have above it, which is what? Buy side liquidity. You want to know what's going on. What's the science? What's the technical fucking science? Why the market's going to go above that? Where's it going? Well, here you go. The technical science. ICT delivers. There's a fucking algorithm, folks. It's literally booking price based on what I'm showing you here. It's not in books, but you have to start where? Ground zero. Understand where liquidity is. That's going to act as a draw or a magnet on price. If it's going to go up, why is it going to go up there? There's orders up there. It has nothing to do with any other Mickey Mouse fucking patterns that may be below that. That's your religion. That's what that is. You have a cult-like mindset if you believe in Supply and demand, Elliott wave, harmonic patterns, animal patterns, trend lines, moving average crossover. That, none of that shit is the catalyst for why price went up there. The orders resting above those fucking highs, that's the real reason why. There's no other reason why. Zero. You honestly fucking believe that these investment banks, these large funds, these firms out there are literally swinging on the hopes and fucking prayers of these Animal fucking harmonic patterns. You really fucking believe that? 
Like, really, there's billions of dollars being shuffled every day. And you think, honestly, you think that that shit is what they're using? These fucking people laugh at that stuff because it's nonsense. It's the equivalent of the same thing as the last time my elbow was aching. The market went down. I'm going to be a short seller today. It, it's, it's the equivalent of that. There has to be scientific, something tangible behind it. And you may not agree with an algorithm being here. You may not agree, but that's what's really going on. Put that aside. Put that aside for a moment. Is this not more palatable if I'm showing you how to use market structure in a lesson I've already taught institutional market structure? I'm showing you an advanced version of that using the logic as to why I called live in yesterday's afternoon PM session. Some of you just don't like me, and that's the wrestling point. Some of you don't like me because you can't keep up with me because you're an educator and trying to sell shit. And you want to try to kick shit in my face and try to mar my image and stuff. Fuck all that. I don't give a fuck. You're not stopping nothing. But you're wasting time and energy because you could learn how to do this and be better and never have to thank me for it. You're wasting your time. I'm not wasting mine. I don't have to do this shit. This is my stuff. I codified this stuff. You're all benefiting from your winning trades because of what I've done. You want to know why, how to, and when not to do it? That's what I'm teaching you this year. Stop worrying about all the other shit. So let's go into a deeper dive on that last hour. I shared, uh, I don't recall, honestly, if it was this week. The lines are blurred with uh, the what I shared because I gave you so much this week in the previous week. I don't know when I told you about the, the macro in the last hour being 315, which would be represented by in your chart. If you have trading view set to New York local time, it would be 1515 to 1545. So one quarter past the hour to one quarter before the last of the hour, that 30 minute interval, there is a last hour macro that runs and I'm going to explain that to you here. If you look on the right hand side of your chart, you take uh, <clears throat> a more swig of this spring water here. Are you enjoying this kind of lesson? <laughs> I don't enjoy getting yelled at. This is some bullshit. You want to learn how to do it, right? Well, listen to good medicine. Doesn't taste good, but swallow. Final hour macro. There's a little rectangle I have annotated in the price action. The largest lower blue rectangle, it's anchored to the candle at 14 colon 48. Okay. So that fair value gap is extended to the right. I had that extended right over in the live session yesterday, and I was watching and observing a scene because we had all of the volume imbalances in that segment of price action that is seen between the, the high of <clears throat> 15 colon 19 which would be the, the little short-term high that bumped up to the bottom of the middle rectangle not the volume imbalance not that little thin one but that high down to the low formed inside of the fair value gap around 40 87 50 in price but the time is 15 colon 25 or 25 minutes after three in between that range there's multiple fair value gaps i'm sorry multiple volume imbalances so it's spotty and i mentioned this yesterday and for a better understanding of what i mean by what i'm saying here you can literally just watch the pm session final hour of uh, live stream i did yesterday i actually talk about that as it's occurring and it causes a little bit of uncertainty it makes it harder it's a harder read on price action so you have to wait for it to do whatever it's going to do and then use what it gives you after that meaning i was expecting it to maybe dig down into here and then run here 
it went down to the original fair value gap I had noted here. And then as it went down here, I said, I'm going to pull it down to this one. I'm actually talking over a chart like you're fucking seeing it. Sorry. <laughs> I was looking at the fair value gap formed at uh, 232. So on your 232 or what would be represented on your trading view chart at 14 colon 32, that fair value gap is where I annotated and changed the fair value gap to that one. Just watch the live stream that I did yesterday. You know exactly what I'm talking about. So it's kind of like that's supported um, documentation for what I'm teaching here today. Because there's a lot of volume imbalances inside the, the price action between 317 and 328, that's spotty price action, you have to wait for the displacement. Where's the draw on liquidity? The highs at 4,100 and plus. So what are we going to look for? You wait for the displacement. We see that happen on the 329 or what we represented by 15 colon 29 candle. We break higher above a short-term high that's formed. The short-term high that's there, it's 15 colon 26, that minute candle. It rips through it and trades. And we go watch that afternoon session live stream. I said, I want to see it trade above the fair value gap that is on the 315 candle or represented by a time on trading view at 15 colon 15. I want to see it go above that and come back down and act as support. Wouldn't you know it? It trades all the way back down to the lowest point of the fair value gap on the 15 colon 34 candle or 34 minutes after three. Where does that occur? It's inside what? About the midpoint of that last hour macro. Remember, 315 to 345. It's going to create a price run on liquidity that has not been purged. Where is that? Those relative equal highs. Your attention was taken to those relative equal highs anyway. So now we're looking at a very specific, quote unquote, scientific event. There's an imbalance, that fair value gap that's on the 14 minute candle. After three, in other words, 15 colon 14 for time. That little middle rectangle that's basically at the 4092 level, the low end of that fair value gap price is 4093.50. And it goes exactly to that price and stops, stops dead in its tracks. No fucking zoo patterns, no animal patterns. Elliot wasn't riding no wave here. No supply and demand, no trend line horse shit. It's very specific price points. Very specific. Technical science. Uh, and Anton, <laughs> Anton Creole. It ain't technical science. Around here, we use technical science. And nothing fucking comes close to this. There ain't a motherfucker out there that's keep teaching anything that's like this. Nothing like this. Nothing else is closer than perfect. This precise every fucking day. Come on. Seriously. <laughs> you don't have to like me, but you got to fucking love this. Okay. This is the market. You want to be trading. You want to be precise. This is the stuff you want to be using. And it trades right into that fair value gap. And we want to see what? We want to see it advance higher. Does it show willingness to go higher? It does. Trades higher and breaks above the last up close candle before it dropped down into that lower fair value gap on the candle at 11 minutes after three. So 15 colon 11, that up close candle in the middle of that candle is mean threshold. I mentioned in the live stream, all this stuff was called out loud live in front of like 12,000 people were in there. I said, I want to see it dig through that. That is that little pink level that's anchored to 4095.25 on the chart. I told you as a visual aid. I wanted to see it rip through that, not just dance around it. We had what? It created a volume imbalance at the, what is that? 37 minute after three. So 15 colon 37 minute marker. That candle opens higher. 
trades down to the pink line that I have in the annotated, which is the mean threshold of that bearish order block. Market rallies away from that and then comes back down on the candle at 42 minutes after three. So 15 colon 42. We overshoot the volume imbalance. That's fine. Volume imbalances can be traded through. I'm very forgiving, and I mentioned this also before. I don't know exactly where I'm at in that live session, but volume imbalances, they can trade through them multiple times. But if you know your bias, where it's likely to draw to, at a later time, it can come right back up and go back to respecting the very specific levels, which is the low, the consequent encouragement midpoint, and the high of the, the volume imbalance. So it, that's that signature I'm looking for. Does it respect it? Does it allow for continuation going higher? Well, look closer. That low at 42 minutes after three, so 15 colon 42, we go through the volume imbalance that's formed between the candles of 15 colon 36 and 15 37. So that little volume imbalance where there's no bodies touching or overlapping, it's just a separation from the bodies alone. That's the volume of balance. It wicks down through it on the candle at 1542. Then we advance higher, but the next candle we open where we trade down to. The volume and balance high, which is the opening price on candle 15 colon 37. That opening price is 4095.50. The low of the candle on 15 colon 43 or 43 minutes after three New York local time, that low comes in at 4095.50. What's the similar relate? What is there a relationship between that and the opening price on 15 colon 37? It's the same fucking tick. It's the same value. So what happened? It wicked through the volume and balance, opened, traded down to the volume and balance, and then what happens? Boom! Off to the races. It rips through the fair value gap. It rips through the relative equal high at 1539 candle and 15 colon zero two candle. So there's relative equal highs there. There's buy side. So if it's going to go through that, what's it going to do? It's going to really ramp up to run into the relative equal highs at 1020 and 125 which was the real draw on liquidity the whole day. So we see it tear into it, comes back down, hits the fair value gap formed on the candle at 128, or for this trading view chart, it would be 13 colon 28, the, the longest blue rectangle drawn out. That's the fair value gap I'm actually drawing your attention to now. The low of that fair value gap is the high on 129 candle or 13 colon 29 time candle that one minute candle high that high comes in at 4096.50 the low of the candle that retraces after bumping above the relative equal highs is on candle 15 colon 51 the low of that candle comes in at 4096.50 what's the relationship there it's the same fucking tick of the low, the fair value gap formed at 128. And then what does it do? Runs right on up to 4104.25. Now, listen, folks, listen, listen, listen. When you have spent 26 fucking years of your life and you look at the market like this, every day and you tolerate these fucking imbeciles all over the world that try to troll and they try to fucking make a name for themselves and talk shit okay and don't ever bring anything nothing equivalent to this not even close we're not even in the same fucking neighborhood you are learning the highest fucking form of financial information as, as a part of speculation nothing else is better Nothing else is more superior than this, okay? This is the shit. This is the shit that Enigma really fucking implements. And you wonder, and you honestly fucking wonder, how am I, how am I so accurate? How am I so 
Well, how does he fucking know? I'm using all of this technical fucking science. You're seeing it live. <laughs> I'm calling it. I'm telling you what's going to happen. Now I'm here fucking telling you every individual candle. Really? And you still can't fucking believe me? At this point, I don't give a fuck if you believe me. I don't care. I'm having fun. And I know a lot of you today, because you've walked through this exercise, you literally are jacked the fuck up right now. You're jacked up. You're, you're probably vibrating right now. You're excited because there's nothing random in these markets. There's nothing fucking random in these markets. Not one fucking bit of randomness. Nothing is random. Even when there's manual intervention, when a rate announcement or some Mickey Mouse shit that comes out of nowhere, they rip the markets really, really far. But you're going to look real close and see it's just to a volume imbalance. It's just to a fair value gap. It's just a bump right below a low or a high. Everything I teach you, but I can't humanly predict how far a manual intervention or when a manual in intervention come, come in. Black Swan event, some kind of unannounced bullshit. That's the inherent risk of trading. That's always there. And sometimes you'll get hurt from it. That's the risk that every one of us assumes when we speculate. So why are you not teaching with a live account? Because I'm teaching in the most responsible manner I can. I know, I know you want me to put you in live trades. I know you want to do this right away and make money because you, you'll feel stronger. You'll feel more confident. You'll feel more energized and more plugged in. And you'll be more motivated to study more because then you'll be making money. Whereas right now with a demo, oh, yeah. I'm not inspired. If this kind of lesson and this precision doesn't inspire you, get the fuck out of here. Seriously, get out of here. And if you can think that's disrespectful all you want, you're disrespectful to me as a student because you're coming here half-assed, expecting me to pour everything into you, give you signals, and I'm an asshole because I won't do that. No, I'm not going to give you signals. I'm going to teach you. I'm going to pour my fucking time and energy and effort into making you what you want to be independent, not needing me, not needing anybody. That's why you're here. There's no fucking ad revenue right now. Okay. Nothing. I'm doing this because I fucking love it. I love this. This is my whole fucking life. And you're not entitled to fucking learn this. None of this I'm obligated to teach any of you. My charter members that paid me have never fucking seen this lesson before. They've never seen this before. And the attitude that you motherfuckers come here and are disrespectful to me and say, oh, well, you don't do enough. Why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you doing that? Man, listen, you need to sit down, shut the fuck up, and just take notes. You're going to learn everything and more. It's going to be on my timeline, how I want to deliver it. And at the end of the year, you're going to be transformed. You will be a different person. You're going to be a fucking savage. But you just simply have to listen. Just listen. Take notes. Observe. Record the things I'm, te I'm teaching because they fucking repeat. The logic repeats over and over and over again. But you won't appreciate it. Until you do this kind of work where you dig into the charts and you take the information I'm teaching you to go and say, okay, I'm looking for this. Does it do this? Oh, shit, it does. That's exciting, especially when you find it and I didn't tell you to look there. That's what the students, that experience, that epiphany, that aha moment where they don't need to have any more further convincing about a, a particular concept that may or may not be acceptable to them initially when they first come here. Once they start seeing, it's like, oh, wow. Yeah, it's really there. What, what else can I learn about it? That's the right mindset. That's the right mindset. So, I think it's time for ice cream. <laughs> I do believe that those individuals that have gone through this, and if you didn't go through it live, obviously you can listen to the recording. 
And I'm almost certain that someone's going to be making a video <laughs> doing the very things over a chart. And that's fine. That's cool. But it would be better for you to try to do it in your own chart. And then maybe look at the folks that do this on their YouTube channel using this as an exercise when they show it to the viewers of their channel, what it looks like on the chart live. Don't rush or, or wait for that guy or that gal to do that on their YouTube channel. You're, you're missing the learning experience by doing the audible version of this. Walk into the charts, listening to me. And then have everything mapped out on your chart as you just go, go right through a blank canvas of data and second, well, not second, but uh, confirm that you have the right fair value gas with the visual aid I gave you on Twitter. If I would have had an experience like this when I was 20 years old, there's no telling where I would have went because I would have all that time to use this information. For a long time, I've been afraid to share a lot of this stuff because the algorithm is doing things at these specific times that I can't teach you that part. But I can't be faulted or held accountable or punished for teaching you like this. And it was very hard and a lot of prayer and guidance from a voice that you may not believe exists, but it, it was guiding me, telling me what to focus on and how to bridge that gap because I prayed and prayed and prayed. How can I bridge what the algorithm does into a language that way I can communicate it to others? Look here. Look here. And I took you there today. I did to you how it was done to me. I just cussed a lot. That voice didn't. The effort and time and energy that was invested in trying to make a language and seeing things that would repeat. The algorithm does a whole lot more than what I show. I know most of what it's doing, but there's some things that I can't communicate or was ever successful in bridging where I can teach very, very close to what this thing does at the times that it does it. So the things that I have been very successful in doing it, and I believe it's transferable knowledge that you can see repeats, it's, it's there. That's what my mentorship is. And there's nothing that you can argue about. You can say, you know, I'm a nut job because I'm saying I'm hearing voices. Okay. I don't care. I'm glad that you say those things because I will, I will be rewarded for that. But you can't say it doesn't work. You can't say it's renamed retail stuff because it's not. Just because I'm using a Fibonacci to take your attention to a level. Nobody uses a fucking Fibonacci like me. In fact, I've been trolled. Nobody does a Fibonacci like that. You're fucking right nobody else does that. You're right they don't. Very specific ranges. When they're multiplied within a specific sequence. Reaching to what? Liquidity. <laughs> It's not limited to just buy side liquidity and sell side liquidity. It's reaching up to an imbalance that you may be targeting as well. And I'll leave that part for you to study on your own. But the first lesson I teach all of my students is to look for the draw on liquidity. That's where the market's going. Why? Because there's real orders there above the highs and below the lows. Yeah, of course, everybody knows their stuff, but nobody's fucking trading like that until I started teaching it. Everybody's using those double bottoms to buy. Everybody's using the double tops to sell. None of these fucking books was talking about going up there and attacking it. I have no books ever written, ever disclosing that's what you're attacking. You're going to do that. They're all teaching the same regurgitated horseshit. Buy double bottoms. 
the fuck out of here. I would never buy a double bottom. I would never fucking do that. Never. I would never do that. Despite going back in history and saying, look, here's a double bottom. And I know there's going to be some assholes. Look at this right here. Look at this right here. They didn't trade it, but they're going to show you examples. Look at this double bottom. It, it moved. It moved here. It moved here. Yeah, that's right. And I'm going to be looking at the trade that formed later on that ran through that motherfucker. I can't trade retail. I can't tolerate it. I can't do it. I can't. Those, those theories hurt me. They fucking took money from me. I'm not going to fall victim to that horse shit no more. And I'm trying to do my best passionately and not as eloquent as I probably could if I was a more balanced individual, but I can't stay balanced if I'm in a live session like this. And barely, I'm going to swing back and forth. And I apologize for that for the folks that don't like that. And I'm not a family friend, friendly mentor when I'm in a live capacity like this. I'll lose control of my tongue. And that's the only thing I regret ever once I'm ending these things. And I ask for forgiveness and I'm asking for forgiveness in front of you right now as the listener. I don't want to talk this way. I don't like that part of me, but I can't control it. I wish I could, but I can't. So you have to take that with the, with the good, filter it. I want you to do well. I want you to learn. Whether you believe or not, the best thing you can do for me is to pray for me to be able to get through this year to be effective in teaching what it is I want to teach you. Because I'm teaching you live. And I'd be, I'd be lying if I said I wasn't ashamed of how sometimes I can't control myself. I don't feel like a good advocate because I can't control how I say things. But what I'm saying is the fucking truth. And I would hate for any of you to listen to my delivery method, the approach that I'm using and, and the frailness of my humanity and my inability to control myself. I would hate for that to be a hindrance in your learning. And that's the reason why I teach with recorded. I've tried to keep that from being a hindrance. But I know this fucking shit. And I can do this. You're seeing it live. And I don't want to be anything but a conduit where you are improved as a speculator, as a trader, and not at all hindered by anything I've done, taught, failed to be able to do effectively. So pray for me to be able to do this more balanced. I already know it, but I need to be balanced as I'm doing it. I'm a human being and I have a lot of mental baggage that I carry. And I wish that didn't happen. It's very hard. But there ain't a motherfucker walking that's got as much passion and willingness to teach you that I do. And I just want you to appreciate that because it's wrestling with me all the time. That's it.